I'm delighted to welcome today Gareth Edwards, who is a nutritionist with a bit of a difference. Um, you offer live blood analysis and dry blood analysis to your clients and you don't always recommend supplements, Gareth. So where do we start with, with unpicking all of that? Welcome. Thank you, Elaine. It's great to be here with you and talking to you. Um, yeah, I, I guess um, a lot of how I help people has evolved out of my own experience um, and that was sort of born when I was 21 uh, and I'd been on antibiotics every day for the four years of my life. Um, one a day for the first two years and two a day for the second two years and um, it, that was a treatment for acne um, and as we now know, you know, that antibiotics have a majorly disruptive effect mm -hmm. on uh, our gastrointestinal tract. Um, and with a history of various challenges in my life, um, I, I found myself in a, in a very anxious and disturbed place. Um, and I, my mother recommended that I went to see a psychotherapist, which um, was a, you know, a, a, a actually turned out to be a great bonus because he just sat and listened to me and he said, you're going through a challenging time and I'm just going to sit here on the outside of this and reassure you that everything is okay. And um, during the next two to three years, um, I evolved into a completely different person. Um, you know, the, the things happened during that time period that, that I would never really have anticipated. And one of them was starting on a raw food diet, which when it was first suggested, I thought, well, what, what on earth has your diet got to do with your mood? And uh, the naivety of my 21-year-old self. But, but lo and behold, um, I was living in a yoga teacher's house and uh, I started going to her yoga classes and uh, eating this raw food diet with this guy just listening to me unpack, you know, events of my life. And I suddenly found myself um, in her kitchen in Kingston on Thames, um, where you know, with bare feet and uh, having allowed my hair to grow, and uh, preparing my raw food, and I just suddenly felt more connected to my environment and the world around me than than I ever had before. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say it was a smooth path or a smooth transition, but 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 it was life-changing it really was so um we have something in common there because i was also on antibiotics um uh, i remember taking uh, antibiotics in my teens for for um, spots as, as they were then and i remember my grandmother also showing me how to make a face pack using flowers of sulfur which uh that gosh that's a that's a, a memory way back um i was on antibiotics for 23 years from the age of about 21, 22 to my mid forties. Um, and that was for a kidney disease I was born with. And I was told that I would be on medication for life because the disease was incurable. And uh, Yabu sucks to that because when I woke up to natural health, uh, chiropractor and nutrition um, over 20 years ago now, I, I, I've never taken an antibiotic since, but of course the damage is done that length of time with antibiotics on, on my gut. So, so talk to us about the, the raw food and the nutrition aspects and, and uh, the, the realisation that nutrition has everything to do with our health. Well, I, I think it kind of happened in two stages, Elaine. Um, so when I was 21, that I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to be graphic, but, but the initial reaction to being on this raw food diet was that I literally probably spent about three or four days continuously on the toilet <laughs> yeah which um, which we know is good because it's it's a form of detoxing but when we're in that situation people hadn't been prepared for what to expect it's a shock isn't it and they think they're terribly ill but actually it's a really good sign exactly and uh that, that that's exactly right and and i remember 
uh, it was at my first nutrition college that I attended that um, Erica White, who who wrote the Beat Canada cookbook, uh, was. Did, did you get that last bit? Sorry. The, yes. Yes. Uh, Erica White, who wrote the Beat Canada cookbook, um, was was one of the first people who told me that you know diarrhea was a good thing you know as long as you're not sort of evacuating blood and you know it's going on continuously for three weeks um that in in general principles uh that that it is a part of a healthy detoxifying process um so yes that 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 was that happened and then i i i almost feel if it doesn't sound too pretentious that i wasn't kind of spiritually ready to to deal with being that way at 21 um and and i really didn't know quite where to go with with diet and healing so so i i just adopted a more vegetarian diet and and that turned out to be really high in grains really high in dried fruit quite high in cooked food um and it wasn't until I was uh, in my late 30s that I came back to a path that I that was in, incorporated more raw food and a lot of green juices and and now in, incorporates quite a lot of sprouted seeds and beans. Um, so it, there was a bit of an evolution there. Um, I, I suddenly felt I had so much more energy after this cleanse and there was there was some psychological spiritual emotional well quite a lot of psychological spiritual and emotional work that went on um in my 20s and um and then i just had all this energy and i thought i'd like to be a nutritionist but you know 38 years ago uh it, it wasn't really i didn't see it as a viable career path so i was very lucky that i went away and did competitive sailing um with some of the best sailors in the country um and uh and that was what i did i just went sailing and sailing sailing all the time worked in sailing shops and and that was just a great way to express this newfound physical energy and activity level um and i had some success in that but but my aspirations for that to be my profession were arguably guidedly um not coming to complete fruition so uh in my mid-30s I, I went back to uh nutrition college uh I, I i went and decided i need to study nutrition so i went to the institute for optimum nutrition uh patrick holford who wrote the optimum nutrition bible was doing the welcome day he was lecturing there when i started and i did have some reservations about going on that course because I got the sense right from the outset that what they were going to teach us to do was to give supplements to people mm -hmm. and my experience in um, improving my well-being uh, had not I hadn't taken a single supplement when I'd had that epiphanal experience when I was 21 uh, but nonetheless I, I did the course and and uh felt that it was valid and i did learn a lot from it you know it, it was a definitely a valuable experience um but then in my new uh, and i did then start practicing as practicing as a nutritional therapist but i started to feel a sense of being slightly out of my depth with some of the cases that i was needing to deal with um and um, I'd always had this thought in the back of my mind, and I, and I'm, I, I would emphasize that I'm not a doctor, but, but if I was gonna be helping people with some of the situations that they might turn to a doctor for, um, I would need to study as long as a doctor did. Mm -hmm. So I, I <laughs> and that was seven years. So when I was 40, I, I decided to go back to university and uh, that was a very challenging decision because, you know, my late thirties to, you know, re reset the whole clock on my education at 40 was 
there were a few sleepless nights uh, involved in that. But I did go back to university and I studied nutritional therapy uh, at the University of Westminster for four years. Um, and during that time, um, things started to evolve more. Uh, and, and I came across a, a somebody who is controversial, um, he's, who's Robert Young. And uh, he, he uh, was coming to England. Somebody gave me his book and it just seemed to tie together so many threads, his book, Sick and Tired. Um, and it just sort of seemed to unite some of the lessons I felt I'd learned and some of the things that I was learning. Um, and uh, he was coming to the UK to teach live and dry blood analysis um, directly after I finished my degree. So uh, I enrolled for that course. And during during that time, I'd, I'd had, a, you know, another Medi extreme medical challenge. I had, um, I'd burnt my leg on motorbike exhaust in Bali. Uh, uh, and when I came back to the UK, it just started flaring up massively. Um, and people around me were quite frightened about that. And, and I was admitted to hospital, uh, at slightly against my will, if the truth be known. Um, and uh, I started being pumped with uh, intravenous antibiotics. Mm -hmm. um, and um, while everybody has to take their own path and their own choice, and I'm not counselling people to do this, um, I decided to leave the hospital and follow my own path of healing. Um, and that included... Um, one of one of the things that happened the, the, again the antibiotics had had a dramatic effect on my gastrointestinal tract and i almost just got to the stage where i i had to look at a sandwich you know or some bread or something like that and i and i was experiencing appalling flatulence but on my degree somebody handed me one the course tutor Oh, the, the head of the course handed me this book. Uh, and she said, I think you'd find this interesting. Uh, that was Heather Rosa. And, uh, and she, and I started leafing through this book and, and it said something about the importance of chlorophyll in healing the digestive tract. And so I just thought, I, I'd been to the Hippocrates Health Institute where they give um, wheatgrass as a snack you know if you've ever got a craving for anything at, at Hippocrates it's a raw food vegan diet and if you ever need you know feel you need a crunchy bar or something they send you off to the greenhouse and you start cutting wheatgrass and and, and juicing it um, so I thought uh, you know what what's the best source of uh, chlorophyll that I can get my hands on so I started buying trays of wheatgrass and um, I started and I bought a hand juicer and I started juicing the wheatgrass and, and I started making green juices. And I and I actually got had got to the point with my leg where I was, I mean, literally all I could do every day was get up and go to the health food shop, buy the greens, come back home, juice them, uh, make the wheatgrass juice drink that and, and the green juice and then I had to go back to bed again because I was exhausted and and that had quite a big impact on me reflecting on where I was going with my life because I was working in at Whole Foods shop um, and it was under neon lights every day they were um, you know there was leftover food at the end of the day in, <clears throat> in the catering section which I would bring home I was like it's cheap food you know and uh, and I we would reheat that in the evening <clears throat> and um and it, but it was nutritionally depleted by the time it had been cooked in the central processing unit uh, you know frozen or and defrosted then i'd taken it back home again and reheated it it, it just didn't have nutritional value to it and so I just suddenly began to realize that, that I needed vitamin D on my skin. I'd stopped sailing 
um, you know, that I that I needed to commune with nature more, do more exercise, and and it was just a, another reset. Um, and so, sorry, I'm <laughs> I'm talking quite a lot here, but it's all just coming out. Um, and um, and so that you know, the combination of doing that and then doing live blood analysis with Robert Young, and and when I did the training with Robert Young, um, I I was the keen student who, when he said, would anybody like to volunteer to have to do their blood analysis in front of the class? I was, you know, you couldn't stop me. So, I'm thinking, oh, I'm so healthy. You know, if this is going to be, you know, the model student, you know, who he can show everybody. And it was completely the reverse situation. Um, he He looked at my blood and uh, my live blood and my dried blood and my dried blood was really really showed strong signs of bowel toxicity um and he said to me um you need to do something about this because if you don't you'll you'll possibly get cancer and i was like you know i mean he he does have a technique of you know strongly Sorry, my the internet connection froze. But but so he does have a technique of of you know motivating people in that way. Anyway, needless to say, I went back home again and I drank nothing but green smoothies for you know the next two weeks. But I really didn't know what I was doing because I, I what, effectively what I was doing was flushing expensive ingredients down the toilet because it was just passing straight through me. Um, Anyway, um, but but having done those four years, having changed back to incorporating more green juices and wheatgrass in, in my diet, and and switching back to having more raw foods, and eventually I'd, I'd gone on a bit of a sort of ketogenic thing, you know, sort of meat and vegetables and cut out all carbohydrates. Um, I realised that that. I needed to be on a plant-based diet, um, and and that so that's where I came to, and that's when the healing started to really take place, and um, and I and then I felt equipped to help people, um, and so for the last, I mean, when did I graduate? Two thousand and five. So for the last, uh, well, I don't know how many years that is. Uh, my maths. Um, 17 20. years ago yeah so so 17 years ago since then i've been helping people with showing them their blood and and what i love about the live and dry blood analysis you know if, if you read uh mainstream reviews on google you know the, the uh, about it, it it'll say it, it will be disparaging as as if you read anything about robert young it will mm. be disparaging but what I really love about the live and dry blood analysis is that people get such a strong sense of connection between the impact of what they put in their mouth, its effect on the gut, and then the formation of the blood. Because as Robert Young taught me, you know, the su blood supply to the gut is massive. You know, the, the capillaries, arch you know, not arteries, the, you know, the blood supply and its connection with what happens in the gut gut is completely linked um, and so quite often in live blood analysis when you see variation in red blood cell size um, you you can be reasonably certain that you're then going to see in the dried blood sample uh, a reflection of, of intestinal inflammation and congestion and uh, bowel toxicity. <laughs> <laughs> well, amazing. So you've been through the mill, but you've used that experience to help others, which I think um, pretty much every therapist I've interviewed, uh, myself included, we've we've done the same thing. We've walked a path and we thought, oh, this is good. We could help more people. Uh, but also it enables us to empathise because been there, done that, you know, written the book in many cases for, for some of us. So 
you, you mentioned live blood and dried blood for the benefit of the listeners why would you need two why would you need live and dry blood what's the difference um okay thank thank you for asking me that um so what if you were to go to a doctor and say i'm not feeling very well the, the, a doctor might choose to run a blood chemistry panel and i do use blood chemistry panels the information you get from that is very valuable um what you are doing there though is you you are staining and drying the blood um and and then you use an electron scanning microscope to count the number of particular entities in a sample um what what we do with live and dry blood analysis is um i take four it, it's all done with capillary blood it you know there's there's no blood draw as you would with blood chemistry you know where you've got tourniquets and a, and a and you're, you're doing a, a draw um you with um live blood you just use capillary blood from the tip of the finger and and i take four samples two live blood samples and two dry blood samples and uh the the, uh, the live blood samples you you look at at very high magnification and you're looking at individual red blood cells swimming around on the computer screen and the thing about that is it, it's not altered dry or stain um you you are actually seeing your blood in as close to its real form as it would be in your body as it's possible to get and um there, there have been many you know honorable scientists who have experimented with this method of assessing things um and and what it does tell you is what is going on in the plasma um because with a blood count all you're doing really is that well not not all you're doing because it's really valuable information but but you are counting red blood cells you're counting red blood cell size um you you're assessing hemoglobin content uh you're assessing white blood cell counts and other elements that are like are present in the blood um so cholesterol etc whereas with live blood analysis you you are literally looking at the shape the size and the sorry i'm um, the line dropped out uh you with live blood you're looking at the shape the size and the interaction of the red blood cells and um and most importantly you can see what is going on in the plasma as well so if there are fibrin spicules in the plasma or there are fibrin nests um that gives us an indication around liver functionality um around the level of acidity that it's likely to be present in body tissue which the only other the blood chemistry marker that that would give you an indication of that is the anion gap um and that's not readily available on the nhs um using other blood chemistry panels so i use functional dx blood chemistry panels and you will get an anion gap uh and um electrolyte readings associated with that um but <clears throat> it's a pretty good and clear indicator of the level of acidity in the tissue um <clears throat> when you look at live blood analysis and and it's so motivating for clients they i mean i've had people when i've been doing it for them sitting with me and 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 this guy just went really quiet and and he he was running a vegan cafe and he just suddenly said you know it all was coming to him you know the impact of how he was leading his life and its impact on his health and well-being um so that was half of your question why then on earth would you need to look at dry blood analysis so so the the other two samples that i take are uh, dry blood and and there we just allow a drop of blood to form on the tip of the finger um and we allow that to dry for 30 seconds and 
the what what is happening during that drying process as as i have had it explained to me is that heavier elements are sinking to the bottom and and lighter elements come to the top of the drop and then you touch the slide down eight times on the drop and you end up with eight layers of blood and different things are reflected in those different eight layers um and the way that we look at those dry blood drops is um and uh, we light the sample completely differently. It's with bright field light. You could effectively achieve the same thing by holding the slide up to the window with a magnified glass. And because you're, you're no longer using a very high magnification objective, which you do use with the live blood, you're using a much lower magnification objective, and you're looking at patterns in drops of coagulated blood. And that, that, um, assessment is referred to in different ways by different practitioners but one of the most common uh, ways of describing it is the mycotoxic oxidative stress test um, and essentially one of the main things you're looking at is um, oxidative stress in the body and so if if the uh, pools are if the dry blood samples are tightly coagulated together with a firm fibrin mesh running through it uh then that that is a healthy what we perceive to be a healthy blood sample if they are if those um the dry blood is separated out with lots of white pools in it those are called polymerized protein puddles and they are created by oxidative stress in the body and this sort of <laughs> what you got me going elaine i can just keep going um and and this really ties into the um you know so how do you address somebody who has a high level of oxidative stress and um you, the the conventional nutritional wisdom would be you give an antioxidant supplement but um there is limited evidence to support the effect, efficacy of antioxidant supplements that are synthetic analogs of antioxidants. You know, even ascorbic acid is, is questionable. You know, it, 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 it might have a cleansing effect on the gut and the intestine, but, but actually in terms of, it, it's just not the same as vitamin C. Um, so, I I had the great pleasure of working with um, Daphne Lambert, who you who was one of the original trustees of the Soil Association, um, and she runs now runs something called the Green Cuisine Trust, and she taught me about how you get antioxidants from your food and and anything that you so if you listen to Brian Clement, who is the director of the Hippocrates Health Institute, um, he says, trying to heal people with supermarket vegetables, you can forget it. And, and this is why a major part of my practice and what we're evolving doing now with my wife um, is helping people to source really good quality, recently harvested, low truck mile vegetables. Um, if you can grow it in your own garden fantastic um, um because you know if you take a fennel frond uh you know with all its glorious um foliage uh, erupting from the top of it um and and then for supermarket packaging you cut all those leaves off the top and and put it in a plastic bag then it's antioxidant uh, capabilities and qualities are going to be dramatically diminished um, and you know I, I we have carrots with their tops on delivered you know that the we get from Riverford Organics and why would you want the tops you're just going to rip them off and throw them in the ideally compost but but you're not because that that does still preserve some of the antioxidant capability and you can juice the tops as well so um, the, sorry, I really am going on. So how do you address, um, you know, oxidative stress showing up in the dry blood samples? That, that is 
what I would recommend that people look at and do. Um, but also, there are other things that you can see quite strongly in the dry blood samples, which, I, I'm, you know, you you are in just as good a position to discuss this as I am, Elaine, and any minute now I will stop talking. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, but one of the things that is quite strong, that strong, can be strongly visible, is hypercalcemia, where, where people start to draw down when, when they're buffering acids in their system, and, and that could be from stress, um, it could be from uh, a highly acidic diet, um, or acid forming diet. Um, and, and what happens then is that, that you see radial spokes emitting from the center of the dry blood sample. And, and that is a, that, that through the research that we've done suggests that people are drawing down calcium from their bones in order to buffer acid. Um, and I've seen that completely disappear. I, I mean, I had a client who was, uh, a professional musician, highly stressed, and when she, when I first looked at her blood, it it had these radial spokes and you know juicing and and she did use wheatgrass actually green juicing, um, fresh raw living foods and and that pattern completely disappeared from her blood, um, and um, and we got a much stronger bound up dried blood sample. It's a fascinating topic and we could literally talk for days on this, Gareth, and obviously you're clearly knowledgeable and the amount of training that you've done is quite remarkable over the years. I take my hat off to you, sir. The, <laughs> the, the, uh, the radial spokes you were talking about um, showing the mineral imbalances, um, that's why I also offer clients a hair mineral analysis because that then shows the specificity of the imbalance of the minerals whereas the dry blood analysis will only show that there is an imbalance. And as you say, it's, it's mostly calcium. Um, <clears throat> I had a client recently who came to me for a, another condition and sort of by the by, her, her leg started hurting to the point where she couldn't put her leg on the, on the ground. When she had an x-ray, the bone was about to, to fracture because it was so thin. And uh, she ended up having surgery and had a, a pin in her leg. And when the hair analysis results came back her calcium was off the scale completely off the scale so again more proof it was in the dry blood analysis the radial spokes were there the hair analysis showed various imbalances but the calcium was off the scale and we had this dreadful situation where media governments whoever have milk have milk you know dairy is good for you what a load of cack it's just it's just such misinformation and i get really frustrated about it so one of the first things i recommend to my clients is that they stop taking dairy um which is acidic forming and um the the calcium then you know starts to come back but then obviously you substitute that with with the uh, green green leafy veggies and juicing but what would you say to somebody who uh, you know there's a lot of families now who with the best one in the world they would like my cats uh, on the lap here as you can see <laughs> um Lovely. so um families who live such a fast-paced life they both work you know husband and wife both work the kids are busy being kids um they don't have time to do the juicing thing they don't have time to source vegetables what what, what can they do to to help themselves well uh, slow down <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah. Change lifestyle, but uh, but I, I I appreciate that that is probably down the track, um, and what you need you know people need to fix right now. So so I I I do find myself um, recommending uh, the, the the wheatgrass sachets to people who are in a hurry. So the, I I know you use these as well. Uh, Brit Superfoods um, is is a solution for for people who, you know, I, I mean, I've got a client at the moment who she's just had major shoulder surgery, um, and uh, our discussion started as as the process of recovering from that. You know, how could she build her blood to improve recovery? And she she's had a series of three lots of surgery actually. Um, and our discussion started about how could she improve that and she she literally cannot lift her shoulder 
to assemble and dismantle the juicer. Mm -hmm. So for her, um, we, we uh, have just dispatched a, a bag full of 30 wheatgrass shots. Um, and I, you know, we want her to really build up slowly to having three of those, uh, two or three of those a day. Um, and that you can mix with, I, I would like it to be organic um, juice, commercial juice, um, or just uh, allow them to defrost and, and do it that way. Um, some people are less resistant to um, blending, you know, because that can be quicker, although I'm not totally convinced that it is. Um, but the other way is is to eat your greens, you know, mm -hmm. just every time you have a meal. Um, and but you do need to chew them thoroughly. <laughs> you know, it, it's no you, you can't really eat greens in a in a hurry. So so that's where the blending can come in, um, because then then you drink it like a soup. But but still, it does need a lot of digestion. So I think. The, the biggest underlying thing is just trying in a busy day to find time to take your meals in a relaxed environment. Um, you know, just switch everything off, you, you know, mobile phone off, computers off, and sort of make meals a bit of a sacred uh, event, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Slow <clears throat> slowing down is, is something that very few people even have an, any clue about because life is such a pace and you mentioned oxidative stress that shows up in the, in the analysis of the blood and oxidative stress is huge isn't it and few people realize it's not just what we eat but it's their lifestyle and the stress factor it's it's huge huge impact uh, stress and it's not until people see the blood that they wake up and smell the roses so to speak so i find that the blood analysis a, a marvelous tool um, and the hair analysis i use as well because when people see actually what's going on in their blood and their and their mineral base within their body, they can then make informed decisions, whether they listen to us as, as therapists or not, um, is their choice. But they've got the evidence there that they can then go forward on an informed basis of what they do um, here and after. So um, I've got, you know, lots of people say to me, um, well, they, a lot of people come to me because they've been sent home by the doctor um, the doctor can't find anything wrong. They've had umpteen and one different blood panels. Oh, can't find anything here. Can't find anything there. They've some of them have been sent home literally to put their affairs in order with with late stage cancer. <clears throat> but whatever the situation is, excuse me, I'm going to cough. Excuse me. Whatever the situation is, diet. Um, and stress reduction can turn around the most amazing things. And some listeners will know that I reversed my own stage four cancer in three months back in 2015. So anything is possible when you have the right support, but you need to have the right information. And so many therapists guess, try this, try that. The doctors, you, you, you sit in the doctor's surgery and you see them Googling symptoms. My view is, is like yours, kind of turn things upside down. The symptoms, okay, we, we symptoms are helpful to hear about, but it's what's actually going on. Let's look at the root cause and the blood doesn't lie, the hair doesn't lie. They tell us what's going on and then we can guide people on what to do. It's not rocket science, is it? But we're not taught this and it's unconventional approaches as we have um, that are really starting to wake the world up. But we are um, harpooned and shot at and, and all sorts because of... Uh, this strange way we go about things well uh, it, it, you you can uh understand that in a world where you know it's kind of get ahead or be got ahead of mm -hmm. um the the pressure does feel on us to you know in order to get a mortgage and you know support that and and give ourselves what feels like security and safety um it, it's not and and i i wonder if there is you know now a bit of an awakening occurring as as a result of you know what's happened in the last two years um that 
uh, we, we, you know, the, the, the things like the cost to the planet of our actions, um, you know, whether it you, uh, be, you know, not selecting organic vegetables and, and there's a um, really interesting film called We Need to Grow, which um, shows, you know, that if we continue to use the soil on our planet in the way that we are, um, that by, you know, I think it's something like 10 years time, it'll, it'll, the whole thing will just be, the, our, our fertile soil will be gone, you know, it'll just be dust and we won't be able to grow the vegetables that support our life in it. Um, and I think it's, it's quite challenging sometimes to compute that, you know, in, in a world where all of our security is is based on finance but my own experience saying my little prayers is that when you do choose a different path somehow something seems to support you in a different way um and and i that might sound a bit pippy and la la but but you know if you look after the planet with your choices is there some way that the planet will look after you? And at the end of the day, I used to run a workshop called um, Your Health, Your Wealth. And, you know, I used to say to people, you know, which if you could choose health or wealth, what would you prefer? And they all said both. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it, it's an interesting challenge the world we're in for sure. But um, I'm I'm really blessed because I have got the most magical thing ever, and I've got my I've got my health. I I don't have financial wealth at all. Um, it's not something that's ever really excited me that side of things. Um, but the health and the fact that I'm seven years post stage four cancer, and I've had various other cancers and kidney disease and goodness knows what. But I've never had a day's illness. I've just been inconvenienced. Is how I approach things. And a very much um, mindset, of, you know, positive mindset. So how people approach things. Nasty stuff happens to all of us. You know, you had your motorbike um, injury, and um, you know, for some people that could have been catastrophic, and you could have ended up, you know, completely disabled, as may have happened with some people. But your approach was unique, and and it worked for you. Well, I I, I do have to say that the the threat that was made to me in hospital was that if if i didn't have the antibiotics i could have had my leg amputated mm -hmm. um and and it, it was it turned out to be quite the reverse actually you know that, and i you know you, one has to be careful because in certain situations it might be appropriate for people to be hospitalized i'm not universally counseling mm, of course avoidance of that situation but yes my own experience was very different from that Marvellous. Well, we could talk for ages and um, we've already been on quite some time, Gareth, so we might have to do a part two of this, possibly. Who knows? It's been lovely hearing your story and um, learning how you, you support clients. And um, how, how do people get hold of you? Um, well, through my website, uh, which is food hyphen for for hyphen life dot co dot uk um is probably the best way uh i'm a member of the british association nutritional therapists band so you can look me up on that uh i'm cnhc registered as well um so and my you can ring me on 07510 906 554 <laughs> marvelous gareth edwards thank you so much for your time today it's been a pleasure uh, talking with you Thank you so much, Elaine, uh, and, and thank you for this opportunity. And you yourself are a shining example of um, radiant brilliance, which we are all in awe of. Mm, thank you. I'm, I'm feeling quite proud, actually, because this week I've won an award. Um, <clears throat> I'm the best, uh, what is it called? I'm uh, Business Excellence Awards. I'm the best health and mentoring, no, best health and well-being mentor uh, 2022 in the UK. So I'm feeling very chuffed about that. So there we are. Right. Just shows you what you can can do. And I also went to university at 40. I graduated when I was 40 and I left school at um, 16 with a, just a handful of poor O levels as they were in the day. So if you've got a mind to, uh, there's no stopping us. So thank you, Gareth.